Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rabiul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Down syndrome part 1. This video will contain introduction to Down syndrome followed by brief discussion about the incidence of Down syndrome, its pathogenesis, and clinical features. Then in the second part of this series that I will hopefully upload within a week, we will finish our discussion by talking about the diagnosis and management of Down syndrome. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. First question, what do we mean by Down syndrome? Now always remember, Down syndrome is a genetic disorder that occurs when an individual has an extra, complete or partial copy of chromosome 21. So I am repeating this segment again for my students and then I will explain. Down syndrome is a genetic disorder that occurs when an individual has an extra, complete or partial copy of chromosome 21. It is the most common chromosomal disorder that we know of and it is a major cause of mental retardation or intellectual disability. The disease was described in 1866 by John Langdon Down and almost after 100 years in 1959, it was discovered that the disease actually happens due to presence of extra copy of chromosome 21. Recall that all the diploid cells in our body contain 23 pairs of chromosomes. Among them, 22 pairs are autosome and one pair is sex chromosome. However, in an individual with Down syndrome, there will be an extra copy of chromosome 21 in the cells. So, the number of chromosome 21 will be 3 instead of 2 and it is also known as trisomy 21. So now that we have talked about some introductory points regarding Down syndrome, now we will move on and talk about the incidence of Down syndrome. Now I have already mentioned that Down syndrome is the most common chromosomal disorder that we know of and I have also said that it is a major cause of mental retardation or intellectual disability. Always remember that the overall incidence of Down syndrome in newborn is about 1 in 700 live births. However, maternal age or the age of the mother has a very strong influence on the incidence of Down syndrome. For example, when the age of the mother is less than 20 years, the incidence of Down syndrome is about 1 in 1550 live births. Whereas when the age of the mother is above 45 years, the incidence of Down syndrome is about 1 in just 25 live births. So now that we have talked about the incidence of Down syndrome. Now we will move on and talk about the pathogenesis of Down syndrome. So as you can see in the whiteboard, in 95% of the cases, Down syndrome occurs due to presence of an extra copy of chromosome 21. So in 95% cases, Down syndrome is happening due to trisomy 21 and I have also written the karyotype of trisomy 21. Note that I have written the karyotype in case of a female child. If the karyotype was for a male child then I would have written XY here. Okay so karyotype for a male child would have been 47 XY plus 21. In 4% cases Down syndrome occurs due to Robertsonian translocation. 
and in one percent case the individuals of down syndrome are mosaics so now let's talk about these various mechanisms one by one so the first one was trisomy 21 now the examiner may ask you what is the reason for this trisomy why are we seeing three copies of chromosome 21 in an individual with down syndrome and the answer will be non-disjunction now what is that always remember non-disjunction means failure of a pair of homologous chromosome or a pair of sister chromatids to separate during nuclear division that is happening in cell division. So in the whiteboard you can see that I have drawn two images of meiosis. So this is one image and this is another image of meiosis. And can you spot the non-disjunction? Yes, in the first image we can see that non-disjunction has taken place in meiosis 1. Recall that in meiosis 1 what happens initially the homologous chromosomes pair together and then they separate and ultimately they end up in different daughter cells. But look what has happened here. So suppose this is a homologous pair of chromosome we can for example, think that one came from the father and one came from the mother. So, for example, let's assume that the blue chromosome is of paternal origin and the red chromosome is of maternal origin. They are forming a homologous pair. And normally, in meiosis 1, one should have gone here and the other one should have gone here. But due to non-disjunction, we can see that the pair failed to separate and both of them ended up in the same daughter cell and the other daughter cell did not receive any copy of that particular homologous pair of chromosome. And always remember, in 90% cases of Down syndrome, non-disjunction occurs here during meiosis 1. Now let's move on to the second image. Can you spot the non-disjunction in this image? Yes, it has occurred during second meiotic division. So we can see that uh, in the second meiotic division normally the two sister chromatids should have separated and they should have gone to different daughter cell as shown here. So this is normal meiosis 2. But look what has happened here. We can see that the both sister chromatids ended up in the same daughter cell and the other daughter cell did not receive any copy. So this is an example of non-disjunction that is occurring in meiosis 2. Now always remember non-disjunction in majority of the cases occur in oogenesis but it may also occur during spermatogenesis or even during mitotic division in the early zygote. So coming back to this image so we can see that due to non-disjunction we are seeing two copies of homologous chromosome or sister chromatids in the same daughter cell and when such cells are fertilized such gametes are fertilized by gametes of the opposite sex there is a chance of development of trisomy so that was the first mechanism responsible for development of down syndrome the second mechanism was robertsonian translocation now, in order to understand Robertsonian translocation, first we must know what do we mean by translocation. So now let's talk about that first. Now, in translocation, one segment of a chromosome is transferred into another chromosome. One pattern of translocation is called balanced reciprocal translocation, where there are single breaks in each of the two chromosomes 
followed by exchange of genetic material. Another pattern of translocation is called Robertsonian translocation. Always remember that Robertsonian translocation occurs between two acrocentric chromosomes. What do we mean by acrocentric chromosome? It is a chromosome in which the centromere is located near one end of the chromosome. Humans normally have five pairs of acrocentric chromosomes. They are chromosome 13, 14, 15, 21, and 22. So Robertsonian translocation will occur between these acrocentric chromosomes. And always remember, in Robertsonian translocation, the breaks are occurring close to centromere, and as a result, there is exchange of genetic material in such a way that one extremely long chromosome is formed by two long arms and one extremely small chromosome is formed by the two short arms and the small chromosome will be eventually lost. However, since majority of the genetic material is located in the long arm of an acrocentric chromosome, that loss of the small chromosome is still viable with normal phenotype. So coming back to this discussion, you can see that in the whiteboard I have drawn two images depicting the two patterns of translocation. The top image is showing balanced reciprocal translocation. Note that there are single breaks in each of the two chromosomes followed by exchange of genetic material. And the most important thing that you have to remember regarding balanced translocation is that here no genetic material is lost. And look what has happened in the bottom image. Obviously, you can guess I'm talking about Robertsonian translocation because look, these are acrocentric chromosomes. How can we identify them? They have one very long arm and one very short arm and the centromere is located close to one end of the chromosome. So when Robertsonian translocation is occurring between two acrocentric chromosomes, we are seeing that one very long chromosome is formed and one very small chromosome is formed. So why am I telling you so much about these types of translocation? Because we are seeing that in Robertsonian translocation, genetic material that was present in two pairs of chromosomes, say for example between a pair of chromosome 21 and a pair of chromosome 14 is now distributed among three chromosomes and that will have a lot of problems. For example, it will impair the pairing of chromosome that we see during meiosis and as a result it will increase the chance of development of a gamete that will be aneuploid and when these aneuploid gametes are fertilized by a normal gamete there will be also chance of trisomy how for example, in case of Down syndrome that is happening due to Robertsonian translocation, the fertilized zygote will have two copies of chromosome 21 and also another copy of the long arm of chromosome 21 that is derived by Robertsonian translocation of the long arm of chromosome 21 into another acrocentric chromosome, for example, into chromosome 14. So there will be, in a sense, three copies of chromosome 21 because recall that the long arm of chromosome 21 actually contains majority of the genetic material that are seen in chromosome 21. So it will also act in a similar way as if it is also a trisomy. So that was the mechanism of Down syndrome that we are seeing in the other 4% case and uh, that is 
due to Robertsonian translocation. Now, in 1% case, individuals with Down syndromes will be mosaics. Now, what do we mean by that? That means individuals will contain mixture of cells. In some of the cells, the karyotype will be normal. There will be no extra copy of chromosome 21. However, in other cells, there will be trisomy 21. For example, you can see the karyotype of the mosaic I have written here. So, they will have mixture of cells. In some cells, the karyotype will be normal and in other cells, there will be trisomy 21. And why will we have such individuals? They will have such mixture uh, due to non-disjunction occurring in mitosis during the early stages of embryogenesis. So now that we have talked about the pathogenesis of Down syndrome, now we will move on and talk about the clinical features of Down syndrome. And as you can see in the whiteboard, I have drawn a very diagrammatic image that is showing the important clinical features of Down syndrome. So let's talk about those features now. So the facial features of an individual with Down syndrome will include a depressed nasal root, oblique palpebral fissures. Recall that palpebral fissures are opening between the two eyelids and uh, in case of an individual with Down syndrome they will appear oblique. Again in an individual with Down syndrome the ear may be small and uh, sometimes over folded. The malar and maxillary region will appear flattened and this will give the characteristic flat facial profile that you will see in your textbook. Note that the neck of the individual may be short and skin will be abundant in the nape of the neck, particularly in case of newborns. The hands and feet of the individual will be relatively short and broad. The occiput will appear flattened and in the palm of the hand we will see single flexion crease in 50% of the cases. Now previously in many textbooks and literatures this single flexion crease was referred as simian crease. However, the term simian crease is no longer preferred because it tends to have a negative meaning. Recall that Simeon, the word simian refers to ape or monkey. That's why the term simian crease is no longer preferred and instead we will say that there is single palmar crease. However, always remember the term simian crease for your examination because sometimes in your examination the examiner may ask you about that as well. Now, muscle hypotonia is a persistent feature and that will be also helpful in diagnosing an individual with Down syndrome. Now, always remember, none of these features are diagnostic individually as all are seen in the general population of infants. However, it is the clustering together of these various features that may suggest the diagnosis of Down syndrome. In 40% of the cases, individuals with Down syndrome have congenital heart defect. Commonly, the endocardial cushion is involved. Recall that endocardial cushion contains a subset of cells that are seen in developing heart tube and their function is to form heart valves and septa. So whenever there is defect in endocardial cushion that may lead to atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, atrioventricular valvular malformation etc. And as a matter of fact 
congenital heart disease is a major cause of mortality in infancy or during early childhood in many cases of Down syndrome. That's why early diagnosis and management of such congenital heart defect in an individual with Down syndrome is very important. Now always remember, besides congenital heart defects, individuals with Down syndrome may also have other congenital abnormalities. For example, they may have atresia of the esophagus or small intestine, etc. Now always remember, individuals with Down syndrome have 10 to 20 times more risk of developing leukemia, particularly acute leukemia. And both acute lymphoid and acute myeloid leukemia may occur. And uh, regarding acute myeloid leukemia, the most common variety that may develop in an individual with Down syndrome is acute megakaryoblastic leukemia. So always remember this for your multiple choice examination that which acute myeloid leukemia uh, has higher risk of developing in an individual with Down syndrome and the answer will be acute megakaryoblastic leukemia. Now individuals with Down syndrome may also have sensory neural or conductive hearing defect and they may also have visual problem. We have already seen that they have oblique palpebral fissure and they may also have other visual problems as well. Now, almost all the patients with Down syndrome who are older than 40 years suffer from neurodegenerative disorder in their brain that is characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Individuals with Down syndrome may have disturbance in their immune system that may make them highly susceptible to severe infection, particularly in the lungs. Autoimmunity may develop against the thyroid gland and that may result in hypothyroidism. Now recall I had said Down syndrome is a major cause of mental retardation and intellectual disability. And as a matter of fact, individuals with Down syndrome in 80% cases suffer from severe mental retardation and intellectual disability and their IQ ranges from 25 to 50. Although they are intellectually disabled, they are typically gentle, shy in nature, they are very fond of music and uh, they seem more content with their life when compared to their normal siblings. Now, recall that I had uh, mentioned that uh, in 1% case, individuals with Down syndrome are mosaics. Now, we also had seen that uh, individuals who are mosaics, they have mixture of cells some of the cells contain normal karyotype, so in some of the cells there are 46 chromosomes and there is no extra chromosome 21, whereas other cells contain 47 chromosomes and there is an extra copy of chromosome 21. So individuals who are mosaic, they tend to have milder form of the disease and they may have near normal intelligence as well. Regarding reproduction capability, always remember male individuals with Down syndrome are nearly always sterile and they are unable to reproduce. Female individuals with Down syndrome may reproduce. However, in 40% of the cases, they fail to ovulate and even when a female individual with Down syndrome is able to produce a gamete, there is 50%
risk of producing a gamete that will contain an extra copy of chromosome 21. And when such gamete is fertilized by a normal sperm, there will be development of a zygote that will contain three copies of chromosome 21. So that will be trisomy 21. However, since trisomy 21 conceptions are spontaneously aborted in 75% of the cases, the risk of producing uh, affected live-born individual or live-born offspring from a female with Down syndrome is actually less than 50%. So the risk is less than 50% because uh, in 75% cases the trisomy conception is spontaneously aborted. So this concludes part one of this series. I will hopefully upload part two within a week where we will finish our discussion by talking about the diagnosis and management of Down syndrome. Okay, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.